Good afternoon. I'm Mallory Factor, the John C. West Professor of American Government and International Politics here at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And this is the conservative intellectual tradition in America. Great thanks goes to the Citadel and our President, Lieutenant General John W. Rosa, who joins us today. The Citadel Foundation and our partner, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, ISI, and C-SPAN American History TV. Today's topic, the Bush Doctrine and the War on Terror. Our discussion today will, cent will center on the central tenets of the Bush administration, the doctrine of compassionate conservatism, the principles and justifications for the war on terror, the relationship of the policies of the Bush administration to the principles of traditional conservatism, libertarianism, and neoconservatism. Our speaker today will share with you never before shared details about his firsthand experience as one of the nation's top officials on September 11th, 2001, and during the subsequent emergence of the age of terrorism in the United States, and the challenges of waging and fighting a war in the information age. You will hear about the decisions that led our nation into Iraq in 2003, the concept of anticipatory self-defense, preemption, the challenges of balancing human rights and security abroad while protecting Americans at home. The concept of lawfare and the international institution and laws which bind the United States' ability to protect itself and its interest. But on to the introduction of our guest lecturer, Secretary Donald Henry Rumsfeld. Over the years here at the Citadel, we've had guest lecturers who were naval aviators, who were members of Congress, who were cabinet members, who were White House chiefs of staff, who were defense secretaries, who were ambassadors, who were Fortune 500 CEOs, and who were, and who were charitable foundation presidents. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome one man who has performed all of these aforementioned roles. One man who's performed them all, Donald Henry Rumsfeld. He's lived a life of service from the time in his cockpit of a Navy aircraft through four terms in Congress, service in the administrations of four United States presidents, twice leading the Pentagon as both the youngest and oldest Secretary of Defense, and now cheering with his wife, Joyce, the Rumsfeld Foundation, a not-for-profit organization that supports military charities, rewards leadership and public service at home, and supports the growth of free political and free economic systems abroad. Recently, Secretary Rumsfeld published his memoir, which is Known and Unknown, which topped the New York Times bestseller list. All of Secretary Rumsfeld's proceeds from this book are going to military charities supported by the Rumsfeld Foundation. Cadets, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Donald Henry Rumsfeld. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Well, Mallory, thank you so much for your kind words, and thanks to the Citadel for the invitation and the hospitality and the wonderful tour that I had today. It's an impressive in institution. General, it's good to see you again, having served on the Joint Staff when I was there and with distinction. Uh, it's a fine service to have this class on the uh, conservative intellectual tradition in America. Um, I, uh, I'm delighted to participate in the program uh, with so many friends and associates of mine over many decades. Uh, I turn 80 in a couple of months, and I'm told that if you multiply that by three, 
and subtract it from 2012, it takes you right back to the beginning of the country, which suggests that I have lived one-third of the history of America. That suggests that I have probably also lived roughly one-third of the conservative intellectual tradition in America. Now, now, that either means that we have a very young country, or I am very old, <laughs> or, or both. Uh, I, as um, Mallory said, I spent f four years writing a, my memoir, and uh, I've, part of that time was taking a large 80-year-long archive and digitizing a good portion of it, and we established a website to, to support the, uh, the book. And therefore, if you go into the book and read a paragraph, you can actually go to the end note and pull up the entire memo that that paragraph came out of. And I'm told it's probably the first political memoir of the information age. You know, back in the old days, we couldn't do all that. It, it just wasn't possible, and today it, it is. You've had some very fine talent uh, uh, conservatives here, Al Regnery, Michael Marone, Ed Meese, Dave Keen, Doug Fife, who I worked with closely, my old friend Art Laffer, and, uh, and others. I wish I could have been here to hear their comments and, and uh, their presentations. I think the unfortunate thing is that, that had this class been held not too many years ago, you would have had the benefit of hearing from some of the giants like Dr. Milton Friedman and Bill Buckley and other friends of mine who I worked with over the years. Uh, in fact, it was Milton Friedman who met with me in Chicago at a conference on, and we talked about the concept of the all-volunteer army in the 1960s. And he urged me, I was a young congressman, he urged me to put in legislation that would have our country move from a conscript system to an all-volunteer military. And there were very strong arguments against it. And people said, oh, that would be a mercenary military. And, and of course, what was happening in those days is we did have a, a, a draft system, and people were told they had to serve. But it was only a fraction of the people. Uh, women did not serve, did not have to serve. Teachers did not have to serve. Students did not have to serve. Uh, conscientious objectors did not have to serve. And, and it was just a segment of the society that was told that they were going to be the ones to serve. And by the way, the government was going to pay them about 50, 60, 70 percent of what the civilian manpower market was. And Milton Friedman found that offensive. And, and I did, in fact, uh, put in legislation and testify before the House and Senate Armed Services Committee on the legislation. And, and eventually, thanks to President Richard Nixon, uh, it became law, and the United States shifted to a different system, which has really been a, a, a ben great benefit to our country. There's no question but that the armed forces today, the men and women, every single person's there because they want to be there. They raised their hands and said, send me, and God bless them for it. And, and, uh, but it was, it was that concept of Milton Friedman's that he pushed and pushed early on. I, um, of course, the flip side of that is that, that I uh, also was involved in something that was, was quite apart from a conservative tradition. Uh, Richard Nixon went up to uh, Camp David back in 1970, I guess, or, and uh, when he came back down, he had decided to impose wage price controls on America. And uh, I remember George Shultz came to me and said, Don, President Nixon and I want you to w run the wage price controls for the United States of America. I said, but George, I don't believe in them. And George said, I know, Don, that's why we want you to do it, because it's such a bad idea. <laughs> and sure enough, they were imposed. And uh, what we did was try to manage them so they didn't distort our economy. So we would release a lot of the smaller companies. Uh, we, we had the larger companies report and, and tried to manage them so that we, we did not disrupt the market system. One day I got a call from my friend Milton Friedman. He said, Don, you are doing a terrible job managing the wage price controls of the United States. I said, you're wrong, Milton. I'm doing a spectacular job. We are letting people out so we're not distorting the economy. 
and, and, and we have no permanent employees. Every person we hired was detailed over so that we could move them out. We didn't create a permanent bureaucracy. And uh, Milton said, I know that's what you're doing. But he said, the problem is you were doing such a good job that people are going to get the wrong message and begin to believe that wage price controls actually work, which you and I know they don't. And that was the other side of, of um, the conservative tradition. It's, it's argued, of course, arguable that the modern political conservatism uh, was launched by Bill Buckley and Barry Goldwater. Uh, there's no question but that it has done an enormous amount of good for people. Uh, with President Reagan at the helm, we saw conservatism brought down the Soviet Union in large measure and communism. It's helped spread freedom to places like Eastern Europe. Its free market policies have been a major cause for the stunning economic growth in our country uh, and other countries as well, like Chile. Um, South Korea, Japan, to mention a few. Um, I remember the first time I met Bill Buckley, I was called back as ambassador to NATO to Washington when Gerald Ford became president to chair his transition. And he'd never been elected president or vice president. No one knew him around the world. I'd been ambassador and had contacts in Europe. And, and uh, he said, look, there's a conference going on in Izmir, Turkey, and I want you to go there. And, and explain to people uh, who Gerald Ford is and what our policies are going to be and that, that Dr. Kissinger is going to be continuing as Secretary of State and kind of be reassuring. And the name of the conference was just the opposite of the conservative tradition, supposedly. It was the Bilderberg Conference. And I went there to Izmir, Turkey, walked in, looked around, didn't see too many people I knew, looked in the back in the middle, and there was Bill Buckley. And I said, oh my goodness. And I went and sat with him. And he introduced me to a woman sitting next to him who I'd never met. And um, we talked. It turned out that the woman sitting next to him was a young British parliamentarian named Margaret Thatcher, who, who, who played a role in the conservative tradition. Years later, when President Reagan asked me to become the uh, special presidential envoy for the law of the sea, I, he sent me around to Japan and to, to uh, Germany and the Netherlands and England and France to meet with the leadership to try to talk them out of supporting what was called the seabed mining section of the Law of the Sea Treaty. And uh, one of the stops was in London and I met at, on 10 Downing Street with Mrs. Thatcher. And I started explaining to her exactly what this provision of the treaty would do and I said, basically what it does is it, is it creates an authority, quote unquote, kind of an Orwellian term. And that authority would be in charge of the riches under the sea. And President Reagan wants me to persuade you, if you will, to be supportive of his position that he's not going to sign that treaty because he doesn't think it's a good thing for the country or the world. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Ambassador, that sounds to me like the international nationalization of two-thirds of the Earth's surface. And you know what I think of nationalization. And she had been dismantling the nationalist, nationalized industries in England and uh, was very supportive. In any event, I'm very pleased to be here. This is a terrific institution. It's a symbol of service throughout many decades now. And I thank each of you for your patriotism and your dedication. Um, first, let me make a couple of comments about things I'm, I'm not going to talk much about. The, the, phrase, the first time I heard the phrase compassionate conservatism, it was a friend of mine named Joe Jacobs. He wrote a book titled Compassionate Conservative. And, and he was a conservative, and he was compassionate, and he described that concept. This was back, I suppose, in the uh, late 1970s. Um, and um, he was a, a businessman who cared about the country greatly. Um, he kind of talked about softening the edges of traditional conservatism, uh, and the image that Republicans might be indifferent to the plight of the poor, that, that uh, conservatives might not be understanding of uh, minorities and the importance of, of equality under the law and equal opportunity. Um, he uh, 
he, he was a thoughtful person, and, and I know that this topic's been discussed before, so I'll, I'll not belabor it. Neoconservatism, uh, my friend Doug Feith spoke here on that, and I'm sure many of you heard him. He is a very thoughtful, uh, knowledgeable person, and, and I read his remarks and, and uh, found them most I interesting and instructive. Um, the, uh, that period of the Reagan administration and the Ford administration, the Nixon administration, we had this pressure for detente with the Soviet Union. And it was a, uh, a theory that there were ways to find accommodations with the Soviet Union. And Richard Nixon, and, and actually Lyndon Johnson began, uh, and then Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford continued uh, with Secretary of State Kissinger as the uh, leader of, of that movement. Uh, the, the theory was uh, not unrealistic. It was that you, uh, you ought to be able to find some areas of accommodation, and if you're steely-eyed and, and careful, you ought not to compromise on something that you shouldn't compromise on. But, but by the same token, you might try, reach out, and have a, see if you can achieve a relaxation of tension, which the word detente suggests. The problem with it was that the Soviet Union at the time was increasing its capabilities and was on an uptrend. The United States was decreasing its capabilities on a relative basis. And we have, were moving into a, a roughly a band of rough equivalents where, where they were superior in some areas, we were superior in some areas. I don't know any American military person who wanted to trade their, our military for theirs. But the trend lines were wrong. They were adverse to our interests, without question. And there was a big debate in the United States about whether or what they were spending as a percentage of their GDP on defense. And conservatives and neoconservatives, some people like Democrat Senator Scoop Jackson and, and, uh, and others, stepped up and expressed concern about detente, as did I. Uh, my concern was, was a, a different one. It was clear to me that we simply had to reverse the adverse trend. We had to invest in our military if we were going to have peace through strength and, and have the kinds of uh, deterrent capability that was necessary for our country to be able to contribute to peace and stability in the world. And the problem with detente was they had all these pictures of, of our presidents and the general secretaries of the Communist Party uh, toasting each other with champagne glasses for agreements that were not really terribly important uh, in, in the last analysis. But it left the impression that, well, the Soviets really weren't bad. They, they were not bad. They were kind of OK, because we could have meetings and have meals and clink our champagne glasses. And, uh, and the effect of that was to erode any interest in improving our, our defense capabilities, to erode our willingness to step up and put a higher percentage of our GDP into defense. When I, when I came to Washington and uh, out of the Navy in 1957, um, the Eisenhower administration, we were spending 10% of our gross domestic product on defense. Same thing was true in the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, and today I think we're spending about 4.5 or 4.6% uh, of our GDP. Uh, so anyone who suggests that the, the debt that we're facing and the the crushing deficits are a, are a result of the Pentagon or the Defense Department are simply not looking at the facts because it's all in entitlements because we've actually, as a share of GDP, we've, we've, we're in half of where we were back in the 50s, 60s and, and uh, in that period. In any event, the, um, uh, the, the work was put in and, and during the end of the Ford administration and thanks to the uh, uh, later, the Reagan administration, the kinds of investment that were needed were actually achieved, although the four years of the Carter administration actually reduced defense capability uh, during that period. Uh, a third thing I'm not going to get into extensively is libertarianism. I, I guess we all wish we could live in a world where we could all be libertarians and have a small federal government, but unfortunately, that's not the kind of a world we live in because the first responsibility of government is to provide for the security of the people. And we live in a world that's dangerous. Uh, we live in a world that, where weakness is provocative. We live in a world where, where the idea of another country providing global leadership 
uh, forces one to say, well, which country do we want to do that, if not the United States? And uh, that's, a, that's tough to answer. You look around the world, and, and uh, there are relatively few countries that, that think like we do, that have the same values, that, that have the same capabilities that we do. And uh, so I think most conservatives agree on the need for smaller government, less taxes, less regulation, and, and separating private lives from government. Uh, but but we, many of us disagree on the subject of foreign policy. I, I, I simply do not believe that the idea of, of some form of isolationism uh, is a realistic thing in, in the world we live in today. I, um, I was speaking to at Leavenworth the other day to, I think, 1,400 plus majors, uh, and I suppose some lieutenant colonels, and uh, they asked me, what, what do you worry about when you go to bed at night? And uh, I remember I was asked that question by a senator from Kansas when I was being confirmed for the Pentagon back in 2001, and my answer was, in effect, intelligence. It's a complicated world. There are closed societies. There's a lot we don't know. And, and it's a dangerous world, and I, I worry about intelligence. I didn't answer that question that way at Leavenworth the other day. I, I answered it differently, and it goes right to this point of, of our country's, I believe, um, responsibility to contribute to peace and stability in the world. I answered by saying I worry about weakness on our part. I worry about our withdrawal. I worry about our, our management of our economic uh, affairs. Uh, no one thing specific. I could have said Korea, I could have said Iran, I could have said terrorism, I could have said any number of things. But I said what I really worry about is a, a sense in the world that the United States is withdrawing, that we're less, less willing to contribute to peace and stability. Because if you believe, as I do, that weakness is provocative, that, that, that it is strength that preserves the peace, uh, then a weakness causes people to think about doing things they wouldn't even think about doing if they saw the United States behaving in a way that, that suggested we were not withdrawing, but that we were there, around, capable, not the policeman for the world, not the nation builder for other countries, but the country that was there and, and, and willing to contribute to peace and stability. The, um, few things I will touch on. As, as Mallory said, I'm going to talk a bit about the age of terrorism, the uh, Iraq war, the freedom agenda that's been discussed, the challenges of fighting a war, the first war in history in the information age, and lawfare, and also a few comments about the inadequacy of our institutions, our, our domestic institutions as well as our international institutions. First, the age of terrorism. My first experience with that was when President Reagan asked me to be Middle East envoy after 241 Marines and Navy corpsmen were killed in Beirut at the airport. And, and uh, you'll recall a truck loaded with explosives drove into the uh, barracks where the Marines and the Navy corpsmen were, were uh, billeted and blew it up. And uh, we put uh, some forces in along with two or three other countries and things were not going well and I got a call from George Schultz and President Reagan asking me to leave the company I was running a pharmaceutical company at the time and to, to leave that and and help out so I did and it was um, it, it was a new experience for me who kind of served in the Pentagon during the Cold War and here was something that was notably different than the Cold War. It was terrorism. And uh, I remember um, at that time, people were writing books and giving lectures about the end of history, if you remember that. The, uh, the, the theory was that, that communism was kind of uh, behind us. And, uh, and I ended up speaking to the U.S. Army Association and talking about terrorism. And I said to them, look, as Lenin wrote, the this is back in October of 1984, 17 years before September 11th, 2001. And I said, first, as, as Lenin wrote the, with characteristic terseness, the purpose of terrorism is to terrorize. It's not to kill people. It's to terrorize them. It's to alter their behavior. It's a technique. 
um, terrorism is growing, I said, in the 30 days ending last week, this is 17 years ago, before 2001, in the 30 days ending last week, it's estimated that there were 37 terrorist attacks by 13 different organizations against the property of citizens of 20 different countries. This is 1984. And I pointed out that terrorism is not the random work of isolated madmen. Rather, it's state-sponsored by nations using it as a central element of their foreign policy. I went on to say that terrorism works. Uh, my point was that a single attack by a small, weak element, not even a nation, maybe a, an entity of some kind, a, a network, uh, a, a terrorist attack by a small, weak nation by, or in entity by influencing public opinion and morale can alter the behavior of great nations and force tribute from wealthy nations. Unchecked state-sponsored terrorism is adversely changing the balance of power in our world. And I went on and I said that while security is important, terrorists can attack any time, any place, it, using any technique, and it is physically impossible to defend at every moment of the day or night against every conceivable technique. Uh, and, and that being the case, I went on to say that, that terrorism is a form of warfare and it has to be treated as such. Uh, we can't think that we can defend against it. I, I, I watched what happened in Beirut. Truck goes into the barracks, kills 241. So the next day they put revetments around all the buildings, these concrete things around. So what did they do? Terrorists started lobbing rocket-propelled grenades over the revetments. So the next thing they did was the U.S. Embassy down on the Corniche in Beirut, they, they hung a wire mesh over it to bounce the rocket-propelled grenades off. Sounds logical. For every offense, there's a defense. For every defense, there's an offense. So what did they do? The next thing they did was they started hitting soft targets, people going to and from work. So what's it, the point is there isn't any way to simply defend. That causes anyone with an ounce of sense to say, that means you must go on offense. The only way you can deal with, with that problem is not to treat it like a criminal act where once it happens, you're going to capture the person and then put him in jail or punish him or it, more likely indict him in absentia. Uh, because you can't find him. He's gone. And uh, in any event, that, that is the, 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 the lessons I came away with back in 1984. Um, the um, election took place in 2000. Shortly before that, President Governor Bush came and spoke here at the Citadel. And he talked about the future and he talked about the need to bring the military, the armed forces of the United States into the 21st century, into, out of the industrial age and into the information age. Um, and then came 9-11, a day that cast the shadow over the entire Bush administration. Um, the uh, attack on the seat of economic power in New York, uh, the attack on the seat of military power in the Pentagon, and uh, except for the courage of the passengers on, on the flight that was uh, brought down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, uh, undoubtedly an attack on the seat of political power, either the White House or the Congress, uh, the Capitol. Um, and, and it was a day none of us uh, will ever forget. The um, President of the United States properly recognized that the purpose of terrorism was to terrorize and to alter our behavior and to cause us to change the way we live. And uh, he did something, made a decision that was notably different from our country's behavior through different administrations of both political parties in the preceding period, decided that they had to go on the offense. And, and to use the phrase that was cited earlier, that, that given the lethality of weapons in, in this decade, uh, the decade of, after 2001, and, and the, the risk 
that it could be not 3,000 people killed, but 300,000, um, caused him to conclude that, that he had to declare a war on that and, and do everything conceivable, not to defend only, but to reach out and make everything that terrorists do harder. Make it harder for them to move around between countries, harder to talk on the phone, harder to get money, harder to raise funds through their uh, financial networks, harder to find a country that would be willing to house them and be hospitable to their planning and training and, and uh, uh, launching of attacks on free people. Uh, in my view, it was the right decision. He, um, he was criticized for it uh, because it was different. And, and that's understandable. And he put in place a structure uh, over a period of a year or two, uh, a structure that, that was designed to deal with a notably different set of problems than conventional war uh, and the kinds of problems we basically faced in earlier periods. And it's hard for people to adjust to that, to, to understand different, different approaches. But it was a distinctly different approach. The, uh, at the time, I should, I should add, the, I think it was Johns Hopkins University had a group of people come in, mostly from the previous administrations, the Clinton administration and the Herbert Walker Bush administration, and they did an analysis that they ended up describing as dark winter, where they theorized the placing of smallpox in three locations in, in the United States, major metropolitan hubs with inter, uh, air, air terminals. And within a year, it, 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 it concluded, this independent study concluded that there would be more than a million Americans dead as a result of that. Not a nuclear attack, um, not a chemical attack, but a, in effect a biological attack, and not a complicated one, not something that, that takes a lot of money or a lot of skill sets. Imagine a million people, imagine our country, if, if the goal of terrorism is to terrorize, to alter your behavior, imagine what the behavior pattern would have been in our country. There'd be martial law. You'd have uh, people guarding their state boundaries to, tr not, to try to avoid, I mean, I, when I grew up, if you had smallpox or uh, chickenpox or measles, they put a quarantine sign on your house. And you weren't allowed to go out. And no one was allowed to go in your house. This is back in the 1930s. Well, you can imagine the whole country doing that, petrified, because of the lack of, of uh, protection against smallpox. And, and that was very much in, in the president's mind and, and in uh, the people in government's minds. That, that danger, that, that 3,000 was a terrible, terrible event. But that a million because of smallpox and, and the ease, relative ease, of imposing that kind of lethality on our society uh, by people not armed countries, not major armies, navies, or air forces. And so the structure that the president put in place, mixture of things, the Patriot Act, uh, military commissions, uh, Guantanamo Bay, uh, these were, were, military commissions were old. They've been going on in our country since George Washington. That's, there was nothing really new about that. But, but the, the armed forces of the United States had experience uh, managing detention of prisoners of war, people who wore uniforms, carried their, their weapons openly, had a command structure. All, you had to, they, all they had to say was their name, rank, and serial number, and, and uh, then they could not give you any additional information, nor could you get any additional information unless they decided they wanted to give it to you. That was the, what, what the armed forces was, was organized and trained and equipped to do. Um, we were not organized, trained, or equipped to deal with, with the terrorists. Uh, nor in an environment where the lethality, as Dark Winter suggested, uh, was as uh, grave for our country. So there, everyone was dealing with a new circumstance, as was the president. Uh, the president made a decision to go after the terrorists in Afghanistan, and, and we put together a, a plan with the Central Intelligence Agency uh, where, where with a very small number of U.S. military forces and a very small number of CIA people and a lot of assistance 
supplies going to the Northern Alliance and some militias in the South, uh, were able to defeat the Taliban government of Afghanistan in a matter of weeks. Um, they'd been had a civil war. Here's a country that's landlocked, poor, large illiteracy, uh, had a drought, had 10 or 12 years of Soviet occupation, every conceivable problem you can imagine, had a civil war going on for years with the Northern Alliance trying to fight against the Taliban, and in a matter of weeks, a uh, handful of special forces people, supplies, and f massive air power from the United States were able to achieve a, a, the defeat of the Taliban and chasing the Al-Qaeda out of the country. It was a, it was a country that uh, was run by the Taliban, which was, I think, recognized by only three nations in the world as a legitimate government. They were using their soccer fields to cut off people's heads instead of play soccer. The women weren't allowed out on the street without a male member of their family. Uh, they weren't allowed to see doctors because they weren't allowed to go to school or become doctors, and they couldn't go to a male doctor. Uh, it was a, a terrible situation in the country, and I remember shortly after we went into Afghanistan and were, I had to go around to the neighboring countries and try to find support uh, for our basing and, and overflight rights and, and various types of assistance. I went to uh, Oman, and there was a, a sultan named Caboose in Oman, and, and he was at the time not in the capital, he was out in a tent meeting with his constituents. And it, it must have been 140 degrees in, in, the, in the tent. He sat there just as cool as he could be, and, and um, we were perspiring through three layers of clothes. And he looked at me and he said, he said something to the effect, he, he was British trained, and uh, spoke English perfectly, and he said uh, something to the effect that 9-11 that may very well be a blessing in disguise, as terrible as it was. And, uh, and I said, in what sense? He said, well, it may just be the wake-up call for your country and the world that we will take actions and work together in a way that will prevent not 3,000, but 300,000 or 3 million dead because of the use of more powerful and more lethal weapons. The, the concept of anticipatory self-defense was mentioned, or preemption. We've always, as, as we know, have respected other people's borders and, and have uh, Every country thought every country had the right to do what it needed to do within its own country, but, but so did the other countries, the neighboring countries. With the advent of these lethal weapons, weapons of mass destruction, um, the idea of waiting until you're attacked to defend yourself is one thing if someone's going to come across your border with conventional force. It's quite another thing if you're going to be attacked with, with the weapons of that lethality. And you don't have the option, really, to wait until you're attacked, as had been previously the case when the worry was a ground forces or a bomb or a conventional weapon of some kind. The, uh, that caused the president to, to fashion what became known as a, a Bush doctrine, in part, uh, a, a, of anticipatory self-defense, the real, the real Realism that, uh, the, the realization, I should say, that, that in fact, if you wait, it's too late. And, and that is a hard thing, particularly given the unevenness of intelligence and the difficulty of the intelligence gatherer's task. Another problem that came up was the problem of, of language. And words matter. If you think about it, the war on terror is a phrase. It's in my view, and I told the president this, not perfect. Uh, first of all, if you say war, it sounds like you are going to win this with bullets. And that it's conventional, and that it's the problem for the Department of Defense. When in fact, it is something quite different, and it's not going to be won with bullets. It's much more like the Cold War. It's, it's much more a, a, a battle of ideology and, and a competition of ideas and it's going to take all elements of national power. And therefore, I, I argued 
that war on terror might mislead people, in a sense, and might cause people to uh, expect things that aren't realistic. And uh, I struggled with trying to come up with a better alternative, and I failed. <laughs> I, I, I thought about a struggle against violent extremists uh, and, and, and different ways of trying to do it, and, and the president uh, stuck with war on terror, and, and that's what it's still called largely today. The other problem is, is the un unwillingness to identify the enemy. If you think about it in the Cold War, communism was identified. We, we pinned the tail on the donkey. We talked about it. We said what it did, how it didn't work, how command economies were inefficient, how unfree political systems were not the kind of systems that unleashed human energy and creativity. Uh, and, and, and over time, communism was largely left, um, as I guess President Reagan said, in the ash bins of history. And, and uh, a little bit left in Cuba, a little bit left in North Korea, but, but not much else. Uh, I worried that we weren't pinning the tail on the donkey. We weren't calling uh, it, what it what it really is. And, and it is a, an element of the Muslim faith of, of zealots and fanatics and extremists and Islamists. And that is, that is what it is. And we were scared to death in the administration. Someone asked me one day, what kind of a grade do you give the Bush administration on, on um, the use of words and language? I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm an easy grader. I'd give them a D. Uh, <laughs> I said, give us a D, I meant. Um, but, but why? Well, we were, everyone was very nervous about being seen as anti-religion. And that's understandable because nobody is anti a religion. And an enormous fraction of the people on the face of the earth are Muslims. And, but, but if the fact is that it is a, a small strain of Islamists and Salafists in, in that religion that are the extremists and are causing the problem and training people to go out and kill innocent men, women, and children, then we make, in my view, a terrible mistake by not saying it by not elevating it and calling it what it is. And once you do that, I think it gets clear that we're not going to win that battle of ideas. That battle of ideas ultimately is going to be won within that faith. And we have to figure out how all of the elements of ours and our allies and friends around the world can deal with this threat to nation states. And that's what it is. It is a, a threat to nation states. <laughs> The idea of imposing a caliphate and imposing that narrow set of views and behavior pattern on the world is, is a, something that has to be resisted. And, and the use of force, the training of people to go out and kill innocent men, women, and children to achieve that is something that has to be resisted. And I don't believe you achieve that unless you say what it is, identify it, and find ways to help others in that faith who don't believe that. The overwhelming majority of people in that faith that don't believe it. Find ways to help them battle it within their religion, uh, in my view, is probably the only way it's going to change. Um, I've mentioned anticipatory self-defense. Um, let me mention the freedom agenda. Um, President Bush, in his second inaugural address, said, America's vital interests and our deepest beliefs are now one. From the day of our founding, we've proclaimed that every man and woman on earth has rights and dignity and matchless value because they bear the image of the maker of heaven and earth. Across the generations, we have proclaimed the imperative of self-government because no one is fit to be a master and no one deserves to be a slave. Advancing these ideals is the mission that created our nation. It is the honorable achievement of our fathers. Now it is the urgent requirement of our nation's security and the calling of our time. So it is the policy of the United States to seek and support the growth of democratic movements and institutions in every nation and culture with the ultimate goal of ending tyranny in our world." Unquote. That's a big order. That is a very big order. And, and some people thought that that, if frequently the word freedom was mis, correction, was interchanged with the word democracy. 
And in my view, when the word democracy is used in the world, or outside of our country, the, the risk is that people think of the United States, and they think of this template. And they think that we think that our template of democracy is what we are trying to impose on the rest of the world. And people don't like to have our template imposed on them. They know they have different cultures, they have different histories, they have different neighbors, they have different circumstances. And, and the use of that word, I kept trying to get within the administration, the use of the word freer political systems and freer economic systems as a, a something that was moving in the direction that the president's quote properly says. I mean, we know that the world is a better place. If you look down from Mars on Earth, the countries that are doing the best for their people are the countries that have the freer political systems and the freer economic systems. And, and, and they are the countries that tend not to impo try to impose their will on their neighbors. I, um, let me give you a few examples of this. Uzbekistan, uh, back in 2005. There was a prison break. I'd gone to Uzbekistan, met with Karimov. He was a Politburo member uh, in the old Soviet Union, and he was no Democrat, to be sure. He was a, a, an authoritarian post-Soviet leader. And he had a terrorism problem in his country. There was an Islamic uh, movement that was anti the government and, and uh, um, operated in that region. And there was a, a group that stormed a prison and released all the prisoners in Andijan. And the government stepped in and put that down. When I met with President Karimov, he agreed to let us use his base to put in our special forces people in Afghanistan. He, he, we operated there. He was cooperative. We had overflight rights. It, it was enormous advantage to deal with a landlocked country. We couldn't get in there from the sea. We had to have that kind of cooperation from somebody, and particularly a country on the northern border of Afghanistan. And he was catching the Dickens from uh, Russia. Russia puts pressure on all those Central Asian countries. So does China. And it makes their lives very difficult. So he stepped out and agreed to be of, of help. The United States, with our non-governmental organizations and our human rights groups, saw the Uzbek government put down the people who uh, had gone into the prison and released all those prisoners and became judgmental without the facts, in my view, and uh, said that, uh, that there should be an international investigation. And, and the implication was that the Karimov government, the Uzbek government, had behaved in a manner that was inconsistent with human rights. I knew I didn't know the facts. Uh, I wasn't on the ground. But I do know what the result was. <laughs> The result was that the president of Uzbekistan, Mr. Karimov, threw us off the base. He said, oh, we know who our friends are. And he went back to Putin. Now, why do I make that point? I make the point because if this is good, how we are, that's the theory, we all, our judgment is, if we're like us is, is good. And this is bad, unlike us. My theory is, if someone is on the spectrum, and they may be over in the bad side, not the good side, but they're coming the right way. They're moving in the right direction. They're improving human rights. They're moving towards freer political or freer economic systems or both. That's a good thing, and we ought to encourage that. Instead, we stuck a stick in his eye, and he went right back the other way. So we didn't, we disadvantaged the United States from a security standpoint. And, and by the same token, we disadvantaged the United States and the people of Uzbekistan by sending him back and, and not keeping the forward motion with respect to human rights and freer political and freer economic systems. So I, it's a matter of how you look at it. Now, the reason I come to that conclusion, and it's not the way people mostly look at things in the world, the reason I do is because if, if we're good, we weren't good. Think of our country. Think of what we went through. We had slaves into the 1800s. Women didn't vote into the 1900s. We had a civil war. We killed hundreds of thousands of human beings. A terrible, terrible civil war. We didn't arrive this way. We're still evolving. And those countries are evolving. 
and they don't go from, from a, a, a dictatorial system to a free system in five minutes. It's a tough journey. It's a very tough journey. It was a tough journey for this country. And, 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 and we've made enormous progress. We did the same thing with Pakistan. Pakistan, Musharraf stepped up, supported us, and the war on terror. He was very effective in scooping up terrorists in the cities of Pakistan. Not any good much at all in the federally administered tribal area. He, he sent his people in, tried to, got a couple hundred people killed in his army trying to get in there. They've never controlled that part of the, the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan is wide open. And uh, our State Department decided that it's important to, uh, uh, for Musharraf to go to work uh, in civilian clothes instead of in his army uniform. Because, you know, our president goes to work in civilian clothes. Why shouldn't everyone else? And uh, so they pointed a finger, told him he should get out of the army. He did, and he got thrown out of the country. And the civilian government that came in is weaker, less helpful, and we run the risk of a failed state in, in Pakistan with nuclear weapons. So the, the, it seems to me we have to use judgment and balance and not expect perfection and not expect other countries to be like we are because we weren't like we are over much of our history. It, it, it is uh, just a fact. So I look to see which direction a country is moving and, and hope that they're moving in a good direction. A war in the information age. Um, Afghanistan was the first war in Iraq that were waged in the 21st century, the information age. Enormous contrast from World War II or Korea. Blackberries, iPhones, YouTubes, all bearing images instantaneously around the world. Think of it. It, 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 it changes everything. And, and people are amazing, human beings. We, we, we adjust and we accommodate and we, we learn to absorb things. And, I mean, I grew up where there was no television and, and suddenly there was television. And it, it changed things. But people adjusted to it and, and, uh, and now we have all of these other things. You know, 24-hour news. We still have a government that's basically an eight-hour-a-day government five days a week. Uh, and, and we haven't adjusted to the information age. And at any given moment of the day or night, something's going on in the world that makes a difference to the United States of America. Um, I'll give you one example. <coughs> there was a report that a Koran had been flushed down a toilet at Guantanamo Bay. And there were riots in three countries and people were killed, dead, gone. Now, a lie can race around the world in, in 30 seconds. And, and while the truth, as I think Mark Twain said, uh, the truth is still pulling its boots on. And what do you have to do? You have to find out, what, did that happen? We can't lie. Terrorists can lie. They have media committees, terrorists do. They sit down and plan media things so that they can have events that advantage them in the world by using the free press and the media. We can't do that, and we don't. But what happened? Well, people died. And weeks later, Newsweek magazine that had carried the report that the Koran had been flushed down the toilet at Guantanamo uh, found out the truth, and the truth was it hadn't. It had not happened. It did not exist. And they ran a little thing in Newsweek that said, oh, you know, to the extent our, our article was inaccurate, uh, we, we're sorry. Well, sorry, they're dead. I, I mean, the, the basic lead in, in the news business is if it bleeds, it leads. And, and uh, General Casey, he tried to get some positive news stories in, in uh, Iraq and the papers weren't carrying positive stories. Well, they were putting generators in hospitals and generators in schools and the, the uh, stock market was open and they had a lot of free press. And so he, he said, my gosh, there ought to be some stories. So he hired some people to write accurate stories, not lies, accurate stories, got them in the press. Once it was found out in the United States that that was going on. The Congress went crazy. He shouldn't be doing that. That's a violation of freedom of speech. And, and bango, it stopped. We could no longer put accurate stories in. I bet if I asked the people in the United States of America to do a poll, how many people were waterboarded at Guantanamo, the answer would be, some people would say, oh, probably 100, 200. Others would say 10, 15. Others might say, I think I read three, might have been. The answer is none, zero. Not a single human being was waterboarded by the U.S. Armed Forces. 
in Guantanamo or anywhere else to my knowledge for the purposes of interrogation. The CIA did waterboard three people. But think of, of how that's all been conflated and think of what the general opinion in the America is about waterboarding and about the uh, at Guantanamo Bay, which is, in my view, one of the imp truly impressive prison systems uh, in, in the world. Um, Zawahiri once said, quote, more than half of this battle is taking place in the battlefield of the media. We are in the media battle in a race for the hearts and minds of Muslims. Lawfare, briefly. What is it? What's happening is that increasingly lawyers and prosecutors are using the concept of universal jurisdiction to file lawsuits against U.S. government officials and military personnel. Um, they're putting American officials and intelligence officials at risk of legal action in an attempt to intimidate them and their families to alter the behavior of theirs and of our countries. It is, in effect, an attempt to criminalize policy differences. It's a trend that threatens to subordinate the American people, their elected leaders' actions, as well as the U.S. military, to foreign courts and rogue prosecutors. This is a sizable threat to American sovereignty. Um, I'll give you one example. <laughs> I was at a NATO meeting in Brussels. And the Belgium, I read in the paper that the Belgian legislature's parliament had passed a law that <clears throat> allowed anyone in the U.S. military to be prosecuted in foreign courts. Um, and I thought, well, my goodness, that means we can't have military people go to Belgium, where NATO is. If, if, any, if, if any rogue prosecutor can decide he wants to enhance his public image, he can file a lawsuit, which he did, against General Franks, as I recall. Uh, and and I, uh, so I called in the defense minister of Belgium, and uh, not being a diplomat, I was not very diplomatic. And I explained that, that NATO didn't have to be in Belgium, and that we didn't have to be in Belgium. And within a matter of weeks, the legislation was defeated, nullified, withdrawn, and, and, and it stopped. But it happens all over the world. And my view is it's a danger particularly not just for us but for the world. Uh, for, think of the contribution our military made in the tsunami in, in India, uh, Indonesia, years back. Think of what we did with the earth, um, earthquakes that took place in Pakistan. Our people went in and did a superb job, humanitarian job. Anytime the UN or the OAS or any international organization has, has to deal with the humanitarian crisis, they come to the Department of Defense, the United States of America, and they want help, and we give it. We wouldn't be able to do that if this universal jurisdiction continued. We wouldn't want to send our military people on humanitarian missions if they were going to be prosecuted in, in rogue courts all over the country, all over the world. So it is something that it seems to me even pr President Obama, who apparently is personally authorizing drone strikes, potentially could be vulnerable. Uh, and and uh, I think people ought to think about it. it. It would inevitably lead to isolation, isolationism on the part of our country, and that would be a terrible, terrible thing for the world, in my view. Last, <clears throat> a few words about our institutions. At the inflection point of the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War in the Truman administration, most of the institutions that exist today were fashioned. Here at home, the Defense Department, the CIA, the National Security Council, internationally, the World Bank, the IMF, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the United Nations, all of those things happened in that period. And they have been serving us in varying ways over the decades since. We reached the inflection point at the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the information age in the 21st century some time back, and we have not stepped up to adjust those institutions to fit the 21st century, uh, and we need to. They are not working well. They are, are rusty, and NATO's made some changes. It's been enlarged. Uh, the Defense Department made some changes with Goldwater-Nichols. 
I mean, in the old days, you'd build Boulding Air Force Base right next to Anacostia Naval Base, Naval Air Station, two Naval Air Stations within 15 seconds of each other. Mindless, just mindless. Separate air, uh, runways, separate hangars, separate air controllers, separate security. It was the dumbest thing in the world. Thanks to Goldwater Nichols, much, much greater extent, we're, we're creating a joint force and, and achieving a leverage that's critically important. Um, I think there ought to be a new Hoover Commission, uh, as there was, I think, in the 40s or 50s, to look at these institutions and make recommendations. The problems we face in the world are, are not problems that are going to be solved by one nation. Problems like proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, piracy, drug trafficking. It's going to take us working with other countries and the current institutions, the UN with its vetoes, um, NATO basically oriented internally rather than externally, and the problems aren't internal today, they're external. Last, I was um, in college in 1954, and Adlai Stevenson, uh, no conservative, uh, gave a speech to my senior class. And he said, he said the following. He said, the power for good or evil of this American political organization is virtually beyond measurement. The decision it makes, the uses to which it devotes its immense resources, the leadership it provides on moral as well as material questions appear likely to determine the fate of the modern world. You dare not withhold your attention. If young Americans do not participate to the fullest extent of their ability, America will stumble, and if America stumbles, the world falls. It is. It seems to me that those words are as true today as they were then. Thank you very much.